Well, it's so good to be back. I missed you. Um, I asked you before if you missed me. That wasn't a very warming response. You know, I expected people to jump up and down and expect at least one of you to cry, but... All right, all right, all right, I hear you. <laughs> We're going to talk about where God ends and we begin today. This is a subject that has been something I'm still growing into as a Christian. It's something that I wrestle with because I love the fact that we've been rescued by Christ, saved by grace, but it still doesn't tell me what to do. I'm so happy to be living under grace, but what do I do now? How much is up to me and how much is up to God? And then even if I do something, how do I know I'm doing it right? I know God wants me to pray, but how do I know I pray right? I know he wants me to be kind to others and serve others, but how do I know I'm doing that right? I see other people's gifts and I'm like, man, I wish I could be like that or be that mindful of others. Am I doing this whole thing right? What is my part? What am I supposed to be doing? Has anyone ever thought those thoughts or raised those questions? See, because sometimes it's hard to know where the line is. Especially in James, the Bible, you know, talks about faith and works. But when is time for faith and when is time for works? What's the line? Grace versus our participation. I know I'm living under grace and that God is in control of everything. But then does my work count? Do the things that I do matter? Is this all just smoke and mirrors, and I'm just going through the motions? Predestination versus our free will. We know that God has ordained certain things from the beginning of time, so does it matter what we do, or do we really have free will? Is it really me choosing, or is it something else? And God's will versus our prayers. How, how does my prayers change God? How does a timeless God get impacted by my prayers? Now, these are deep questions, and we're not going to address them all today. But they have a common theme. The theme is, where does God end and I begin? What work am I supposed to do? What is my part Again, is this resonating with you? Am I just talking to myself? Has any of you ever thought these types of questions? And I think this is something that's important for the body of Christ. We hear some things about this in our congregation, and we hear some teaching that touches on a lot of what I'm going to touch on today. But there's a lot of people who don't, who are really, really struggling with the idea of, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And even the things I do do, do do, that's funny. Even the things that I do accomplish, are they the right things to do? Am I doing it right? And we just had a time of prayer. But there's some people, many people, who refuse to pray in public because of fear that they're not doing it right. They refuse to participate in worship when we're singing songs together, because they're afraid of what if I do it wrong? What if I'm off beat? What if I clap wrong? We're often stymied from doing things for God and with God because we're afraid of not doing it the right way. What is our part? What if we do our piece wrong? Then how does that impact the kingdom of God? I'll tell you a quick story. Before joining this congregation, I went to a church that taught 
that we have to be reaching out and sharing the gospel with people or else they're going to go to hell. And that part of my job as a Christian is to get people to pray a certain prayer and make a certain confession so they could be saved or else they would not be able to be saved. So I walked around with a lot of pressure on me because I also heard people preach and say, you know, there's going to be an accounting given once you die. And you'll have to give account. God will ask you, why didn't you preach the gospel to these people? They're in hell now because of you. And that's heavy. Right? So I was on the train, and I was reading a book, The Screwtape Letters, by C.S. Lewis. Uh, if you're not familiar with the book, it is a fantastic book. But it is a book that talks about how men and women can be trapped in sin and trapped in living a way that's against God. And the way C.S. Lewis uses, the, the means that he uses to illustrate that point is a series of letters back and forth from two demons. So one master demon is counseling a younger demon about how to disrupt the life of the charge that he has. Right? It's very creative, very funny, very tongue-in-cheek, but very powerful, very deep. So I'm on the train reading this book. And a woman sat next to, sat next, sat next to me. And she said, oh, screw tape letters. What's that about? And I was like, it's about demons. And I was like, as soon as I said, I'm like, oh. <laughs> then I tried to backtrack, you know. <laughs> so what, what I meant, meant to say was it's, it's about demons, but really it's about, after like 15 minutes trying to explain <laughs> what this book is about, she just said, oh, okay. And she kind of <laughs> turned <laughs> her shoulder towards me. I was like, oh. It's funny now, but at the time, I was really messed up about it because I thought I didn't do my part. Like that was a moment that God needed me to step up and do my part, and I didn't get the job done. And I wonder, I was like, what happened to that woman? I don't know. Sometimes we think about our walk with God like this. We think there's like some kind of a split between us and God. And sometimes there's a question about how much is our part, how much is God's part. And in actuality, different denominations actually teach something very much like this. What percentage belongs to us and what percentage belongs to God? Right, so... With some things, it's just all God, right? But maybe with others, maybe we're supposed to do something. Or maybe it's a 50-50 split. Or maybe it's 75-25. You see how this could be difficult and stressful. What are your reactions to seeing this? What are your thoughts on this or questions? Or what could be the result of thinking this way? Self-human. We don't think of God. You don't think about God, right? He, he's not really factored in to everything? Right. When, I, when I see the picture, and actually when I see it says split, I just, yeah. just that That's word, I think right. it's kind of That's funny right. considering That's God, right. us, split. Yes. I'm just like, that doesn't make any sense. Yes. Yes. We're supposed to be included into what he, you know, with him. The split, it's kind of like we're separating. And yeah, just the word split and us and God. Right. Make any sense at all. Right. 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 I was hoping you'd react this way. I love my church. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the truth is, is that sometimes we can slip into thinking like this if we're not careful. Right? So we talk about participation a lot. And say we go out and we plan an outreach, and then no one shows up. And then, we're, then, I don't know about you, but I start thinking, oh, man, I didn't do my part. I messed up. God gave me a part. I didn't play my part, so God couldn't do his part. Right? When everything's fine, 
it's, it's cool, you know, everything is great. Or it's like, yes, God, you're doing it, hallelujah, right? But when things aren't so good, our minds automatically start looking for who to blame. And then we start thinking about parts and what I did and what God did and how that shakes out, how that breaks down. God doesn't want us to think that's this way, and I'm glad that you reacted to that word split. That's a rough word. That's how we sometimes think, but that's not how God wants us to think. Let's look at the Bible on this, and I got three verses for you this week. Usually I only have one. But because I think it's really important for us to see this in multiple places in the Bible so it can begin to sink in because the truth is so incredible, it's sometimes hard to believe. Right, so I'm going to ask for three volunteers to read these verses. Can I get three volunteers? I want you to read it. All right, Klein, you get John 15. All right, Dana, you got Ephesians 2. Anyone else? And Miss Rosetta, you get Philippians 2. So John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We're supposed to remain in Christ, and only in Christ can we bear fruit. And what fruit in this context is the outcome of living a godly life, a righteous life. So it's not only people and good works, but it's also the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness. Those are the fruits that we can expect that happen when we're in Christ. Amen? All right, Ephesians 2. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Check it out. We were created where? Say it. In Christ. See, a lot of times we read quickly over this and don't really stop. And think, what does this mean? We, created, we were created in Christ to do good works. But all the work that you have to do, where did it come from? Right. God prepared it in advance. Every good thing, everything that you're doing in your life, whether it be in church, at home, taking care of your kids, going to your job, being a good neighbor and picking up trash on the sidewalk, God ordained you to do that good work before you did it. That's awesome. Philippians 2, 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Who is it that works in us? He gives you the want to, and he actually makes you do it. He gives you the want to do it, and he also helps you do it. He makes you do it. This changes or should change how you think about everything in your life. The good things that you want to do, the, 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 the nice things you want to say to somebody, the smile that you want to give as you pass someone on the street. When someone lets you in with their car, the little wave you give them. It's God working in you to want to do it and to do it. You see, we... And I'm going to keep preaching about this till God lets me stop. But we are, are just so focused on an individual life. And God did not create us to be individuals. He did not create us to be disconnected, to be separated from each other and from him. Here's a better image of what participation looks like. 
Agency here means the sphere of where God is working and doing things. So God's agency, the area, the boundaries of his work and his influence. And then human agency is right smack dab in the middle of it. What we want to do. We function in God's agency. All that God is doing, all that we could ever hope to do, is within the sphere of God's influence in what He is doing. We do not live lives disconnected from God. We do not do things separated from God. It is in and through Christ that all things happen. Now, wait a minute. What about my work, my job? You know, I don't think about God then, but guess what? Everything you do is in Christ. And the more you realize it, the more you live in reality, the truth. The lie is that we're disconnected, and sometimes we're connected to God, and sometimes we're not. We get very sensual, right, and say, oh, I just felt the presence of God there. And then you leave, oh, I don't feel the presence of God right now, like you can ever be separated from God. Paul said, because in him we live and move and have our being. Right? Colossians 1, he fills all in all and holds everything together. There is no possibility to be separated from Christ because anything that's separated from Christ does not exist. It is by him, in him, and through him that all things were made and all things continue and hold together. So when you pray, it's not you who's praying alone. You're praying in Christ. And as you pray, he's also offering up prayers so you can't pray a bad prayer. Oh, see, this can set you free if you get a hold of it. You think too little of yourself. You, you live in, in a prison where you don't realize that Everything you do, Jesus is there with you. He's done it and is doing it. You're just participating in what he's doing. Your marriage, it's not you trying to figure it out. Jesus is the one that is holding your marriage together. And if you allow him, he'll make it better and better every day. Jesus is the one that's holding your relationships with your loved ones together. Jesus is the one that keeps you wanting to come back to church. Jesus is the one that you will do all things in and through if you let him, if you recognize the truth and reality of your life. Now, what about bad things? That's the thing that just came to mind. Everything I do is in Christ, but I do bad things. Are you saying that Jesus does bad things with me? No. It's not his will for you to do things that hurt your relationship with God. But even that, God's made provision for. It's called grace. Because even your sins, you're not collecting the penalty of it, which is death. God has made provision and is in his agency that you sin because your sin, if you allow him, will draw you to God. He's made provision for you to overcome sin. He's made provision for you not to reap the penalty of sin. There's nothing that you could do to separate yourself from God. Romans chapter 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is demonstrated and proven by 
the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. This is what it means to pray without ceasing. It is a consciousness and an understanding that everything we do, we do in Christ. And so he's concerned with it all, and he wants you to participate in it with him. And it's him that's doing it. I take God shopping with me all the time. You know he cares about shopping? He cares about everything you do. All right, all right, let's go, Jesus. Let's go get some deals up in here. All right? <laughs> Guide me to where I need to be. Don't let me make stupid decisions with my money. Be here with me. Let me find that one sale that no one else has seen, Lord. Come on. <laughs> Why not? Right? When I was walking my dog today, I uh, came across some Roadkill, right? <laughs> so I talked to God about that. I was like, oh, man, that's a shame. I wonder how it died, Lord. I know you know which one that is, which, which squirrel that was, you know. I hope you're honoring their family, Lord God. I just hope they're all right. <laughs> right? Why not? Talk to God about everything. Yes. Was it the naughty squirrel? It was not. So if you know my family, we are plagued by naughty squirrel. This one squirrel. He steals our bird seed, um, chewed through the wires of our cable. The cable guy had to come out a couple weeks ago. Same squirrel, ringleader, right? All the other squirrels, they fall in line, but naughty squirrel. And he won't die. So no, it was not naughty squirrel. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to get that squirrel someday. I'm going to get him, right? I'm not going to do that with the Lord, though. He's not going <laughs> to. I don't think he's in favor of that. <laughs> They're very dangerous. Patricia, and they mess up my property and everything. They carry the bubonic plague. Oh, I don't want bubonic plague. That's, that's deep. I, don't, I haven't heard about that. All right. <laughs> right, so we're joking, but you see what I'm beginning to say? Because once you start involving God with everything in your life, that is the truth. Right, that's the we, we walk around not living the truth most of the time. Like we're independent, like we're not connected, like God is not there, like, like I can knock this over, right? That's, that's not reality, right? We, we, we walk around just with blinders on instead of seeing God in everything. And then once you start living like that, you'll see that everything is sacred. You won't ever worry about Bible study and how much is enough ever again. You won't worry about prayer and how much is enough ever again. You won't worry about giving tithes and wondering if it's enough ever again. Those, that, that way of thinking is my part, your part. When you see him in everything, when he's already involved, when you see him that is in his agency that you can do everything that you're doing, there's no guilt, there's no condemnation, there's no shame, there's no stress, there's no worry. Because in him we live and move and have our being. He fills all in all. He holds all things together. And he's the one that puts the will and the do in us. There is no separation between humans and God. Therefore, our actions are rooted in and a result of God's actions. This is why this will cause you to want to make changes in your life. There's things that all of us are doing that we don't want to do. And it's not by beating yourself up that you get to stop doing it, that you overcome sin in your life. It's being filled up with something else. And the something else is knowledge that God is all around you, working in and through you. You are never separated from him. If you were, you would not exist because he holds all things together. All your actions are already rooted in and a result of God's actions, whether you realize it or not. 
to not realize it is to live in a fantasy. To realize that God is working in and through you in everything is to live in reality. And I pray that we as a church learn to live in reality. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much and thank you that we live and move and have our being in you. It is in Christ that we live, and all things that we do, we do in Christ. Let that change us from the inside out, Lord God. Let us see things differently. Let us live in reality. Let us live with the knowledge that you're the one who's making things happen and moving in us and through us, and we are participating in the life that you've made available to us by your actions. So free us from guilt and shame and worry and stress over being good enough for you. Realize we already are. Help us stop beating ourselves up and saying, I just want to please God and realize that you're already pleased. Help us not to be plagued by thoughts of what our part is and what your part is. But know that we're just already participating in the life that you've made available to us. Make us free, Lord. Free to be in you. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.